Welcome, welcome back to an empty white void plus a blank shelf. We're continuing on with our Russia series. Last time we covered the Great Northern War, which took place in 1700 to 1721. I know a lot of you guys were disappointed in that one because I looked at the extra credits um, version of it rather than doing Kings and Generals. Kings and Generals is like it's as long as a feature length film. I think it's two hours and 20 minutes. So that means it's going to be like a seven part video. I have no idea. But don't worry, I've heard what you've said. I'm going to cover it. It's just a matter of when. I'll either do this Decemberist one and then keep going on, do the Russian Revolution by Oversimplified, then do it, or I'll wait until go to the Geography Now, then throw it in. Maybe I'll do it in between while I'm waiting for the results of the poll for the next country series. And eh, I don't know, as we say in Austria, Shabamal. So yes, other than that, we're looking at the Decemberists, Russia's first revolutionaries. I think this has probably been the most requested video in terms of comments. Um, it seemed like almost every comment on the Russia series so far is like, check out the Decemberists, check out the Decemberists by Epic History TV. So I'm going to do exactly that. This intro's too long, so let's keep going. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. All helps the channel. Let's go. 1815. At the Battle of Waterloo, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte of suffers his final defeat and two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, Britain, Prussia and Russia, meet at Vienna to decide the fate of Europe. So this is one place that I actually want to go to. I live in Vienna. I am a Canadian, but I live in Vienna. And um, I don't remember where this is exactly, but I know you can go visit it where the Congress of Vienna um, was, was happened, was signed. Obviously one of the most important Congresses in European history, and who knows, maybe I'll make a short video and I'll show you guys. Be like, hey, look at this, I'm here. You know, here's where European history was decided. So yeah, watch out for that one, I guess. The frontiers of nations and empires are redrawn while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list of titles. He also oversees creation of a holy alliance to ensure that no more revolutions threaten Europe's established order. Which kind of lasted. The Russian Empire, after kind many of. great sacrifices in the wars against Napoleon, emerges more powerful than ever. By the way, that was the fourth time that Moscow has burned. Fourth. As far as I'm counting, through this whole Russia series, Moscow has been burned four times. Just putting it out there. But not everyone in Russia is pleased with the new state of affairs. A group of young army officers dream of a different future for Russia. A new form of government, radical reforms. And this guy's having a great a time. Russia without a Tsar. Ooh. Nice. I just love these videos, they're so well done. So well done. Like just so epic. This video I mean, it's in the is name, sponsored but... by NordVPN. If you don't know what NordVPN is, you live under a rock. Go check it out. Maybe a secure rock than having your data stolen. Anyways. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. Yep. It was a defining moment in his reign. We'll get to that, the gentlemen. Underestimated Russian we'll resolve. get to that. Four months later, the remnants of his army began its infamous retreat from Moscow. Crazy. Look at the chaos. The Russian army and its coalition allies then drove Napoleon's forces back across Europe, fighting giant battles in Germany, and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Yep. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye-opening experience. Ooh, I didn't even Imperial thought about that. Russia was an autocracy, oh. ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. There was no political opposition or constitution. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. Yes. Approximately 80% of Russians were serfs, peasants with no rights, freedom, or hope of betterment, their status passed down to their children. 
the inefficiency, not to mention injustice, of such a system was increasingly apparent, even to many Russian aristocrats. In exactly right, and Russian serfdom, uh, Krauk talked about this in his video on authoritarianism, but Russian serfdom, uh, as we have learned together during this country series, isn't this great, is that uh, it was eventually abolished by Alexander II, so not directly after Alexander, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it was eventually abolished and it completely changed Russian society, right? The abolishment of serfdom completely changed Russian society, arguably for the better, and it just uprooted all the social ties that really existed, which at this point, I think it was done in 18, oof, I wanna say 1880, maybe 1875, 1870, don't take my word for that. Um, and once that was eventually abolished, it was really Russia joining up with the rest of Europe because at this point, the rest of Europe had abolished serfdom. And so this was them really pushing forward and modernizing Russia in a sense. Europe serving as officers in the Russian army, they'd visited countries where serfdom yeah, had been swept they, aside by war and revolution. Yeah, so Bavaria and where monarchs one. had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms and acknowledged the rule of law. Many were inspired and began to dream of similar reforms in Russia. I don't blame them. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. Yes. <laughs> but I am the Emperor, right? Bound only by God, I suppose. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Alexander succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. Yes, and Paul was heavily disliked, um, and uh, he was he was the 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 bleh, the Tsar right after Catherine the Great, right? So you have this great period in Russian history. And near the end, not so much, but, um, and then Paul succeeds and is widely disliked by kind of everyone, right? And then eventually is, yeah, murdered. That's a long running theme in Russian history as well. Same with a lot of other countries. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. Yes. In 1797, he'd written to his tutor, to speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. There is only absolute power, which does everything wrong and at cross purposes. The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favoritism. Merit counts for nothing. <laughs> what? The farmer is plagued, wow. commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. The young Alexander displayed That's a pretty quick way to get murdered, a great eh? enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging Yikes. sign to Russian aristocrats who wished to see a more modern Russian state. In 1803, he passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. But it was not passed. But in 1812, Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. Yep. First, an anti-reform faction, led by the emperor's sister, Grand Duchess Ekaterina Pavlovna, hmm. engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor, a sense of personal mission and national destiny. The burning of Moscow, he declared, had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia's <sighs> holy institutions. Yep. In 1815, any officers returning from Europe harboring hopes of reform were to be severely disappointed. Alexander added insult to injury by granting a liberal constitution, not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Not one, it turned out, 
he planned to honour. Oh, Three years okay. later, when Alexander why. raised the possibility of a Russian constitution based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Idealistic nice young guy, officers, eh? more alienated than ever, decided that if the Emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to organise secret societies, and to plan a revolution. Cool. Uh, that's isn't that something that we really do take for granted you know especially in, in western societies is having that freedom of speech and i'm not gonna sit here and get into a culture war all right it's not my point but it really is you know something that i would think that a lot of people don't say would would say nowadays that they don't fear death on the battlefield but they they speak that they fear to speak out for justice right and that's you know kind of one of those moments where when you study history and you look back you go yeah, we're actually in a better place now than we were then, and that's one of the positive things. Again, not everywhere in the world. Don't. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century and was mm -hmm. popular among army officers. Yep. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. Nikita go. Muravyov, a captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decemberists' revolt. Oh God, that's he weird. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Oh, they're doing like a deep fake. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov uh. Apostol, Aged 30 at the time of the revolt. He would lead the Decemberist uprising in Ukraine. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decemberist coup in St. Petersburg. Still weird me out. And Colonel Pavel Pestel of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising, officer and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. Hmm. Interesting the how they're Union all quite young, too. soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights, to form the Union of Prosperity, with more than 200 members. Its charter, known as the Green Book, set out how the Union was to be organised. It also hmm. spelled out its commitment to educating the public about Enlightenment ideals of virtuous moral citizenship. This, it was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Only a trusted inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals of securing a constitution and ending serfdom. Excellent. Okay, all right. Team Decemberists, I suppose. So far. I'm gonna, I might regret those words in the next 20 minutes. The leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander had tightened censorship laws while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. <laughs> For the moment, he tolerated them, telling one courtier, You who have served me since the beginning of my reign know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. <laughs> His new closest advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars, and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, and absolute loyalty to the Emperor. He loathed almost anything to do with Western Europe. You don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once remarked. 
<laughs> Arakchev was put okay. in charge of the Emperor's latest idea, the so-called <laughs> military settlements. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in new villages organised like military camps, with strict discipline. Hmm. It was a harsh policy, even by the standards of Russian autocracy, and led to misery, riots and rising resentment against yeah, the regime. Arakchev also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Oh. Small infractions were brutally punished. Oh. Officers who spoke out on behalf of their men were dismissed. Okay, I hate this guy. Because as someone who, um, I won't get into it, but who is, was, whatever, uh, reservist in the Canadian Army, I can certainly tell you, every single time you see a troop on parade and they're an MCM, a non-commissioned member, they don't want to be there. <laughs> Soldiers hate parades. Officers love parades. But the guys who got to stand here, like, I've, I've done this, I mean, not exactly in the, um, in a hollow square, not in a long time, but, oh, parades are just the worst. So, yeah, this would be a very quick way to being hated by all your men. In 1820, a protest by the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment, one of the army's senior units, led to even more savage punishments. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments yeah. had fallen out of love with the regime. Right. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of palace coups led by army officers to secure dynastic and political change. Yep. The crucial task was to be ready when the moment came. All of those were covered in the History of Russia video. Go check it out if you haven't seen it yet. This is a great video so far. This is really cool. Really, By 1821, really interesting. the number of new members joining the Union of Prosperity made its founders suspicious of infiltration and discovery. So they dissolved the Union. Its most trusted and committed members formed two new groups, each with around 20 to 30 members. The Northern Society was based in the Russian capital, St. Petersburg, and was initially the more moderate organization. The more radical Southern Society was based in Tolchin, Ukraine, where mm. several Decembrist officers were stationed with their regiments. Both societies spent their time holding secret meetings at the apartments of their members. They would stay up late into the night discussing political ideas, reading aloud from banned literature, drafting manifestos and resolutions. So I'm curious then, if this is only the officers that are really scheming to do this, how or what, maybe they'll get into this in a, in a few minutes, but what was their plan to bring their, their NCMs and their NCOs, uh, so their non-commissioned members and their non-commissioned officers, um, along with them? That's what I'm kind of curious about, because it's great to be scheming up these ideas amongst officers, but what about the men that are actually going to have to, you know, overcome all this and really overthrow the government, boots on the ground, so to say? Hmm. The Northern Society adopted a draft constitution by Nikita Muravyov as its aims. His moderate document would make Russia a constitutional monarchy, but was otherwise heavily influenced by the US Constitution of Ooh. 1787. Hmm. He too called for a division of power between executive, legislature and judiciary, with each imposing checks and balances on the others. The executive was the emperor, supreme official of the Russian government, who would command the armed forces, lead foreign policy, and had the power to veto legislation. Hmm. The legislature, a people's vietche, or assembly, composed of a supreme duma, or senate, and a house of representatives. Okay, so... Serfdom would be a... I'm curious though, so, and this is just something because I don't know too much about it, but on other countries, certainly around this time, and I would imagine during the, um, the, the liberal 
not really uprising, but the sort of liberalism that was that was in 1868 and maybe 1848. I always screw those dates up. Anyway, something that ends with an eight. How influential was the United States Constitution? Because at the time it was, you know, a relatively, actually, I would say incredibly radical document, right? How influential was it on other European powers, on these secret societies? So, for example, in in, in Prussia, in, in France, and in even the UK, well, UK is a little different but because it was their former colony. But I'm kind of curious about that. Like, maybe you guys can let me know in the comments section below. But what other countries sort of looked to the U.S. Constitution and said, bingo, that's how we should do it. I'm curious. Abolished, and there would be equality before the law. The right to vote would be restricted to those who owned a certain amount of property. There you go. Thus excluding the very poorest Russians. I was waiting for something. The Russian <laughs> Empire was also to become a federal state of 15 regions, each hmm. with their own executives and assemblies. However, in 1823, a new member would take the Northern Society in a much more radical direction. 27-year-old hmm. Kondraty Relyev was so another young. war veteran and a famous poet. Only a year older than me. passionate, eloquent, Why, this and devoted to the cause of revolution. He was known for his satire of the hated General Arakchev, secretly circulating amongst Russian liberals. All fear, tyrant, for evil and treachery, thou shalt be condemned by thy posterity. He just hated Ilyev despised monarchy in all its forms. There are no good governments in the world, except in America, he declared. He proved there a highly go. influential figure, and soon a radical wing of the Northern Society formed around him, taking up his argument for a Republican revolution. A friend described a meeting at his apartment around this time. There must have been more than a dozen people in the room. But at first, I could not distinguish anything because of the dense blue haze of pipe and cigar smoke. They were sprawling on sofas and on the deep window sills. Young Alexander Odoyevsky and Bestuzhev sat cross-legged, Turkish fashion, on a Persian carpet. An intense youth with a pale complexion and prominent forehead lifts a glass. Death to the Tsar! The toast is received with emotion. Reliev's jet black eyes light up with an inner flame. They sing to the death of the Tsar. The rhythmic chant flows through the open windows for all to hear. Yeah, and so this is what I mean, is that wouldn't it just take, you know, a few of the lower ranking members to then report this to someone else? I mean, again, this isn't like you can call them on the phone, obviously, but you know what I mean? Like, that's kind of the question that I'm trying to figure out here is that is everyone else mildly a part of this? I know everyone hates the new general, but, you know, how is that sort of working? You guys can let me know below. Hmm. Based. The leading figure of the Southern Society, based in Ukraine, was Colonel Pavel Pestel. He provided the group with its own constitution, Ruskaya Pravda, Russian Truth. This lengthy, unfinished treatise was much more radical than Muravyov's constitution. There was no place for an emperor in Pestel's new Russia. The former supreme power has already sufficiently proved its hostile feelings towards the Russian people. The current order will cease to exist. Pestel called for a revolution, spearheaded by a provisional supreme council that would implement gradual but sweeping change. The two main needs for Russia are clear. A complete reorganization of the state order and structure, and the publication of a completely new code of laws while preserving everything that is useful and destroying everything that is harmful. Serfdom wow. would be abolished, land redistributed to the peasants, class privileges abolished, and the vote given to all Russian male citizens. Wow. You just have to wait 100 the years or so for that to really societies happen. remained in close contact, kind despite of. major differences of opinion between and within both societies. Fascinating. There was still much that bound them, 
All desired the abolition of serfdom and conscription, the end of autocratic mm. government, the establishment of new rights and freedoms for the Russian people. But I can see where What's this is more, going. They felt themselves to be in step with a spirit of the age, as revolutions and conspiracies spread across Europe in the name of liberty. Such events reaffirmed their conviction that change in Russia must come from direct action. A coup d'etat, or revolution. This is a great video so far. I'm really having fun here. I hope you are too. And thank you if you made it this far in the video. I really appreciate you, seriously. You. Yes, you. Thank you. In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. After That's urgent true. communications with the Northern Society, Brilyev's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. But in December, unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. Hmm. He died at Taganrog, aged oh. 47. Okay. Typhus was the most likely cause. Hmm. Alexander's sudden death was a shock to all Russia. The Decembrists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the new Tsar was. Constantine? Alexander right? had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest uh, of yeah. his younger brothers, but then Grand Nicholas, Duke Constantine. Right. Yes, but Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came up. So three years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger yes. brother Grand Duke Nicholas his heir. Yeah, and they didn't tell the court, right? And that was the big difference, is that he did not tell the court um, that Nicholas was to be the succession. And so this led to a lot of chaos um, when the succession overall uh, happened. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. Yep. All of Russia assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Patriarchs, politicians, and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. But Constantine, based in Warsaw in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Again, Nicholas urged him. his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. Meanwhile, the Decembrists in St. Okay. Petersburg were meeting daily. They had been caught off guard by Alexander's death, but the chaos of the Interregnum provides perfect cover for them. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Ah, Ilyev works without pause. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. That December, rumors, confusion, and fake news swirl around the <laughs> Russian capital. Nice. Grand Duke Nicholas knows he is not popular with the troops. They regard him as another martinet, overly fond of inspections and parades. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. Wow. In the okay. early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. 
he will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St Petersburg. The Decembrists know that if the troops swear that oath, their cause is lost. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. The 14th of December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. Oh. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital will run with blood. Amazing. I mean, not that actually happening. But. Thank you to all the Epic History TV. Thank you, Epic History TV, for another amazing video. Wow, that was awesome. <laughs> I am pumped for part two. I want to watch it like right now. I mean, I already know how this ends, but I want to watch this right now, but I'm going to wait so that I can do it together with you guys. All right. So that was that. Uh, pfft, what an amazing video. I'm so glad that you recommended that to me in the comments. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. This one's long enough. Thank you very much for joining me tomorrow. There will be part two to this amazing, amazing, amazing video. And uh, yeah, then we'll continue on with our Russia series. Thank you all very much for joining me. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe if you have not. And I will see you guys in the next video. Take care.